Now it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Or you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about toke on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Poplin, Oregon, at Rolla J Studios. Freedom! Freedom! Hey, this is great! Freedom. Yes, Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy Poop Dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonta Graphics, the sultan of Sativa Statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical, Russ Belleville. All right, welcome back, everybody, to 4 o'clock hour here in the Pacific Time Zone, where we are completely potted up on weed. <laughs> and it's oh, Shark Week, apparently. All potted up. Oh. We had a shark there attacking Brian the Red as we speak. Watch out. I hear if you punch him in the eye, that's your only shot, man. Punch him in the eye. There we go. All right, I, I put the shark up just because um, I feel like I'm being... I've got predators after me today. In addition to getting into these uh, arguments about the, you know, hemp cannot save the planet stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I also took on a guy on Obamacare. Some of these righties on my on my side, because it, it's it's funny to me because they're complaining like crazy about the website. They're calling it 404 care now, right? Because you know, website when you can't get a response know, is the 404, 404 right? Yeah. All right, so they're joking. They're going off about this, you know. Oh, it's it's not working, and seniors don't understand, and it's not gonna it's not gonna work, and it's got these glitches, and it's never gonna work. And then one of my favorite writers, the Rude Pundit today, wrote an awesome article quoting all these senators and all these people about how the new program wouldn't work, how terrible it was, how it was too confusing, how the websites were glitchy. Except it wasn't Obamacare, it was the uh, Bush Medicare Prescription Part D that rolled out in 2006. <laughs> Some of the same people who were complaining about how terrible the new Obamacare is, is rolling out were the same people who were defending Bush's Medicare Part D when it was going through some of the same kind of glitches. So so that was part of my day today. But again, this isn't the political show. This is the uh, marijuana political show. So I'll stick with the marijuana thing. And it's this hemp article that is uh, pretty damn funny uh, in that in the way people are reacting to it because there's you know four or five times in the article the guy makes pains to say look there's no reason to ban hemp it's a great crop it ought to be legalized it's, it's going to have it's it'll have a, it's a, a good little market it, it, it ought to be legalized all this guy was trying to do was point out that some of our rhetoric is a little overblown he points this out about uh, how there's little demand for hemp in Europe Demand fell through the 20th century as industrial buyers increasingly chose cheaper or better alternatives for many applications, often artificial fibers. And in Europe, many places, they can grow it perfectly legal. They can have as much as they want, but they're not choosing it because they've got other options. Now, you can make the argument that a lot of the other options, being these artificial fibers, being derived from oil, leading to the problems that oil brings. If you want to make that long argument, you can. But right now, if hemp were legalized, these companies are not going to switch from their cheap oil-based artificial fibers that are stronger to move to hemp. Now, eventually they'll have to. <laughs> we'll run out of oil, or the planet will be so hot we can't live on it. You know, there, there's reasons to move to hemp. But part of these arguments about hemp can save the planet fail to take into account economic realities, like for example, all these farmers that are going to grow hemp would have to not be growing something else that they're currently growing. So what effect does that have on, you know, various agricultural markets and such? And again, this idea that, you know, 
that they would just give up their cheaper artificial fibers to use hemp because, well, it's good for the planet. I wish they would. Oh, man, I sure wish they would. But the economic reality is they won't. Here's another uh, part from the article here. Uh, it says, um, best known historically for its use to make paper and rope, neither of which are often made with hemp these days because there are better materials. The crop's versatility is its major selling point. It's used in the manufacture of fabrics, household products, fuels, plastics, construction materials, and all kinds of other stuff. It has gained some popularity as a food ingredient in recent years. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has said that the market potential for hemp seed as a food ingredient is unknown. However, it probably will remain a small market like those for sesame and pop, uh, poppy seeds. The one big benefit of hemp, its environmental footprint is relatively small. It requires few pesticides and no herbicides. It's an excellent rotation crop, often used to suppress weeds and loosen soil before the planting of winter cereals. On the other hand, it requires a relatively large amount of water, and its need for deep, hummus-rich, nutrient-dense soil limits growing locales. And that's part, of, that's part of that argument about, you know, well, one acre of hemp is like four acres of trees. Yeah, but you can plant trees almost anywhere. Trees will grow in a lot of places where hemp, it would be tough to get a good hemp crop for paper. So there's a lot of issues with that. Uh, I do want to point out there was one problem with the article I did find, uh, and that was he was pointing out the farmer in Colorado, uh, Laughlin, Ryan Laughlin, who just harvested uh, his, what, 60 acres, I think he had 50 acres, something like that, that he planted of hemp and recruited 45 people to help him harvest the crop because use of a mechanical combine would have harmed the plant's stalks. But the problem is that uh, Laughlin, and I got this from other reports from people in the comments, Laughlin had a, a, a problem with other weeds that were growing. He didn't plant the hemp close enough, uh, dense enough, so he couldn't use the mechanical processes because there were other stuff in there. So that was a little bit of a, of a distortion in that spot. But um, anyway, we've got more stats from this article. We'll talk a little bit more about hemp. Again, my point is that it's not a drug, it's a crop. It should be legal just for that alone, regardless of how beneficial it may or may not be. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers, because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. When you are starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The law office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activists to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1-855-MMJ-LAWS for more information. That's 855-665-5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your Fired Up Lawyer, or email firedupmoyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855-MMJ-LAWS, 855-665-5297 for your Fired Up Lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. 
Call today. Four ten p.m. here in the Pacific, in the Pacific time zone. Hanging out here with Ryan the Red. Hey, hey just chilling. So this latest article that's up on Modern Farmer is causing a lot of um, consternation in the marijuana movement. Why legalized hemp will not be a miracle crop. And again, it's funny to me how much this guy uh, goes to point out how it should be legal, how it's a good crop that does a lot of wonderful things, but (laughs) it's not going to be the miracle that saves the planet. I think I said sometime, one time when you can find me uh, a way that hemp can replace an iPhone and a cheeseburger, then maybe uh, an iPhone, a cheeseburger, and uh, an internal combustion engine. <laughs> maybe we'll figure out how we're going to save the planet. Saving the planet is going to require a whole lot of things. Hemp will help. Hemp will definitely help. There's no doubt about it. But let's not overstate the case. Let's not give our opponents the chance to paint us as the hippy-dippy, wavy, gravy, you know, pie-in-the-sky dreamers. Let's show that we're serious about this and that the reasons don't have to do with some sort of conspiracy or some sort of uh, uh, nefarious uh, plot to keep hemp illegal, that it's just ignorance and that it's a crop. It just needs to be legal because it's a crop. There's no reason for banning it. There was a couple of other uh, interesting points that were in this article I wanted to point out. Um, He says that uh, this is uh, writing in Modern Farmer. He says production of hemp varies considerably year to year, but in general, it has been steadily but slowly rising. In 1999, 250 million pounds were produced. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, in 2011, it was 280 million pounds. That's pounds, not tons. The FAO says the increase is mainly due to rising demand for food supplements and body care products made with hemp. And uh, there you go. So 280 million pounds isn't a lot when we're talking about the millions and billions of tons of other products that are produced in agriculture. Again, not to say that we shouldn't be producing hemp. It's not to say that just because the rest of the world uh, hasn't uh, utilized hemp as much as possible that it should be banned. No, of course, hemp ought to be completely legal. My argument, in part, stems from the fact that if hemp were the miracle a lot of the people on our side claim it is, a corporation would have taken advantage of that by now and made a whole bunch of money from it. That's one thing I do count as a constant in the world, is that if there's a buck to be made, someone will find a way to make that buck. And I always, I always shudder at these conspiracy theories, even from the beginning, of why hemp was banned. When people get into the, oh, it was DuPont to, you know, have it stop the competition with the synthetic fibers and blah, blah, blah. All, all these conspiracies, which Stephen Wishnia wrote an article in Alternate that attacked the uh, the origins of hemp uh, conspiracy theories. I, I'm less likely to believe in conspiracies than I am in to believe in people's natural greed. And that if there's a major crop out there that can do everything we say that it can do, then a company by now would have found a way to make money off of it. America is not the only place companies exist or that capitalism exists. If this plant, this plant's legal in France, then there should be a French company that's making a ton of money off of hemp by now. It's legal in China. I know China's communist and all that, but they've got, they've got production capabilities as well. And we just don't see them producing as much hemp as they could. Canada, Canada's got, I mean, they don't have as long a growing season. It's a little far, farther north. But, again, most of the hemp they're producing is, is to satisfy our market. I would just think that if, you know, we would see more use of hemp paper, for example. I, I just can't believe, and maybe someone can talk me out of this, but I can't believe that United States' sole prohibition of hemp is what's keeping hemp from burgeoning into this industry that it's supposed to be. That it's just the U.S. that's doing this. Because it's not like marijuana, where other countries also agree with us and, and, or are forced to agree with us and keep marijuana illegal, keep you know, cannabis for drug purposes illegal. That I see how this global prohibition has an effect on the worldwide you know, cannabis. But with hemp, pretty much every other country, industrialized country, allows it to be grown, except us. 
So really, it's just us that's stopping the rest of the world from making the most out of this? I know we have a big hand in the global economy, but is it really that big? <laughs> we have really that much power? Um, I don't know. Well, maybe that much influence. You know, it, it, people can't grow it because it's illegal all over. In America, yeah. Yeah, well, but, you know, with the international drug policies, you know, as well. No, they can grow it. They can grow it in China. They can grow it in, in oh, Canada. Oh, hemp, yeah. Yeah, that's what but, I was saying. That's but, what I'm saying. We're talking about hemp. But, here. you know, the DEA reaches, it, you know, has a long reach, you know. So. Yeah, but I don't think, I don't see the DEA reaching into Canada. I mean, they went to get Mark Emery for psychoactive pot seeds. They're not going after the Canadian farmers that are growing big plots of hemp. Yeah. That's the thing is I think if somebody, you know, there's nothing stopping an American entrepreneur who wants to grow hemp from moving to Canada. Well, I guess there's, you know, work visas and stuff. But, you know, you get my point is someone who wants to make money on big fields of hemp could do so right now. They couldn't do it in America, but they could do it in another country. So why didn't someone else in another country already do it? That's what I, I, I just want to know. Why isn't there a Chinese billionaire, Chinese hemp billionaire by now? Why isn't there a Canadian hemp billionaire or millionaire? That's, that's what I'm curious about. And again, none of this means that I don't want it legal. I just don't want us to look like fools when we're arguing for it to be legal. That's all. Yeah, true. All right, let's see. Uh, if you let me get the link for this, by the way, uh, this modern farmer article because it's going around. I've seen it in a lot of different blogs, uh, a lot of different uh, reports on that. So we'll see if you guys enjoy this. Uh, okay, so stereotypes got a theory here about the limited hemp research, and this is one I've heard as well. I talked to Chris uh, Conrad about this, <clears throat> and one of his points <clears throat> was that these other crops have enjoyed the benefit of research uh, on the crop itself and development of machines and techniques for harvesting, and hemp is like 80 years behind that. And, yeah, maybe. Maybe there's a little to that, but I think um, I think that uh, uh, the technology is not that far behind as far as harvesting hemp. It can't be that different to harvest hemp than harvesting other like crops, and, and it's not like Hemp is that unique. There are other stocky crops that we harvest for fiber. So, uh, Noam Chomsky has an answer for me. Okay, give me a link to the Noam Chomsky because I, I would love that one. Uh, I respect Chomsky's uh, thoughts on these things, so we'll see. Um, the limited hemp crops uh, limit the research. Um, yeah, maybe, but I don't know. Not per se harvesting, but product development. Hmm. There's now there's a point there. You're talking about maybe the development of hemp cloth, like uh, being able to come up with something that's softer than an onion bag, right? Okay. So there's that. There's the development of that develop of of. And we have seen more body care products and lotions coming out. Mm -hmm. So there's that research and development stuff. I'm not saying that the hemp market won't grow. I'm not saying that there's not money to be made there. But let me give you the ending of this guy's article because maybe this sums it up pretty well. None of which is to say, hey, tokers and tokets, radical quiet you. To introduce you. None of which is to say that the outlook for hemp is not bright. It certainly seems to be, as long as we keep things in their proper perspective. That means ignoring claims such as hemp becoming a trillion dollar crop that could finally allow people to grow money on trees. Right. It's going to be a crop. Yeah. It's going to be a crop. It's a crop. And, it's gonna, and people will farm it, yeah. like farmers have farmed other crops. And... There will be products made from it, and they will be good. And it can grow places <laughs> that other things can't grow very well. Yeah, and it's and like they say, good rotational crop. Mm -hmm, yeah. And and the effect that it could have on reducing the need for fertilizers in the next crop by you know following the you know tilling up the soil and breaking up the soil and helping to provide nutrients. I mean, there's a lot of benefits from it, no doubt. All this guy is trying to say is let's not overstate the case, and let's not take our stats and facts. Uh, in a vacuum. Let's let's not take them out of context. Let's remember the context that's involved in a lot of these statements. And remember when the billion dollar crop article was written, it was 1932. Okay, so you know a lot of a lot has changed since 1932 as far as far as other competing crops, as far as other competing artificial fibers and artificial sources. So we have to keep things in perspective and argue about them in context. But um, yeah, let's just not go crazy on this thing. All right. Time for a break. 
phone says so. We all know what that means. I'll be in Denver tomorrow. I'm flying on a plane at this time, so there'll be no live show tomorrow. Keep that in mind. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Hey, Tokers and Tokets, Radical Russ here to introduce you to my friend Matt and all the staff at Lush LED Lighting. Growing plants indoors can be a rewarding hobby, but electricity bills can go through the roof. Then you have to cool down all those big hot lights. It can drive a grower insane. With Lush LED Lighting, you can solve many of these issues and double your rewards. If you thought LEDs were meet the tech of today, Matt and his scientists have developed the perfect light for flowering plants with far less cost and heat. And the results? Let's just say I appear at a lot of events with the masters of indoor horticulture, and the harvests I saw from Lush LED Lighting were big, tight, sticky, and very effective. Check out LushLEDLighting.com right now and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Double your rewards and lower your expenses with Lush LED Lighting. I'm a reefer smoking man. Woodpipe Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! You ever seen a news story like this? Um, you know, when uh, shit hits the fan, I never really thought about it before, but you know, it's kind of sudden and violent, and that's kind of what happened this week. What about the children? But you know, I just want to say fuck you guys very much for judging me. Uh, you know, for using a plant to do whatever, it's none of your damn business. I don't ask you why you drink your face off, okay? But the deal is, I harmed no child. Your one-room schoolhouse of choice. Your one-stop freedom shop. It's the Libra Lounge. And uh, remember, kids, as always, do your fucking homework. Music from the Screamin' Cheetah Wheelies. There's a great band name. Cheetah Wheelie, huh? Yeah. It's time for Toker Talk Radio. The phone lines are open at 971-533-7111 if you want to make your voice heard or join us in the chat room. I'm getting a lot of good responses in the chat room, and I'm waiting for my Noam Chomsky links, because I dig Noam Chomsky. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if we... Uh, <laughs> well, I want to I want to go on from that from that article. Enough uh, enough on the hemp thing cuz uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the marijuana legalization in both Washington and Colorado. There's a great article up on time.com, uh, Time magazine, New Laws Chart Course for Marijuana Legalization. How Colorado and Washington state govern their legal pot markets will be a test case for the rest of the US. And I would say for the rest of the world as well. Uh, we have all sorts of monitors from uh, Latin American countries, South American countries that are paying attention to what's going on with uh, Washington and Colorado. And this article does a good job of pointing out the differences between the legalization plans in Washington and Colorado, and I thought I'd go through them. First of all, they point out the similarities that both Washington and Colorado tax marijuana and regulate the legal markets requiring security, lab testing, sale to 21 and over only, 
limiting to an ounce how much you can carry, no out-of-state investment, and seed-to-sale tracking. So that's the same in both, Washington and Colorado. But here's where the differences are in the approach. One difference is in the taxing of the marijuana. Washington's got three levels of 25% tax. Colorado is voting on two levels of 15% and 10% tax. Next month, they're voting on that. So uh, this is where they're trying to find out, you know, uh, as the way they say, uh, Sam Kamen, who's uh, with UC Denver, uh, said it's about trying to find the sweet spot for taxation. His quote is this, we want this to be a self-funding regulation that is robust, but we don't want the price of legal marijuana so higher, so much higher than the black market that it becomes attractive again. The black market becomes attractive again, end quote. Sweet spot. This idea that we've got to get the taxes high enough to pay for the regulation, but low enough to compete with the black market. And this is where I think, you know, for all of the hand-wringing that's going on about the taxes in Washington and Colorado uh, on our activist side, oh my God, these taxes are too high, which they probably are. But for all the hand-wringing, I really think this is the kind of thing that works itself out when these regulators who think that they could pass these kind of taxes and that they'd actually work find they have empty pot stores that nobody is shopping at, <laughs> especially in Colorado where you can grow your own, right? If the taxes, this is something we've always said for years, man. If the taxes are too high, we'll overgrow them. We'll just grow our own, right? And that's an especially salient argument in Colorado where you can grow your own. It's perfectly legal to grow your own now in Colorado. If they set, if, if AA passes, which it's likely to pass, and that tax is too damn high, nobody shops at the pot stores except maybe tourists. They don't make as much tax money as they thought they were going to make. And they're faced with two choices. Raise the tax, which is not going to help, or lower the tax to try to capture more market. It, it's the economy, man. That's the way it works, right? Now, in Washington, it's a little different because in Washington, you're not allowed to grow your own. But it's no more illegal to grow your own than it has been. If you were growing your own before and risking that felony and risking that prison time, the risk hasn't gone up. In fact, the risk has gone down because now marijuana is not contraband. So if you happen to have an ounce on you when you're walking around or two or three or four, the mere smell of it or sight of some of it is no longer enough for the probable cause to get a warrant to bust you. They no longer have drug dogs that search for marijuana. So while, yes, Washington didn't legalize home grow, it made it easier to home grow. It made it easier to get away with it. And so that will still have the effect of, once again, if the 25, 25, 25 is too high and they come in with weed at $12 a gram and nobody wants to buy that but tourists and they won't realize the tax revenue they wanted, again, they'll have to figure a way to get that tax revenue by either lowering the price or, I don't know. So sweet spot. Now, to me, part of the problem is they got to come up with these super tight regulations in order to make sure the feds aren't pissed off. You know, all this seed to sale tracking and super security and all that. And so we're in this transition period where the, the, the economic effect of prohibition will still be in play because it's still illegal in 48 states and, and federally, right? So we'll still have all of the economic pressures of prohibition but it'll be a legal product that can be marketed and taxed. And this legal marketed tax product still has to compete with the prohibited product that will still be in, will still exist because the legal product has to tax itself high enough to make sure that it's not being diverted to the illegal product, which is untaxed, which is cheaper, that people continue to buy. So we have to have stronger regulations that raise the tax. You know, it's this weird, self-fulfilling negative cycle when you know the solution would be legalize it nationwide, drop the price to a buck an ounce. Nobody cares about it much anymore, but that's beyond the realm of reality at this that. point. No, I'm not going to do that. So here's some other differences in their law. Uh, unlike Colorado, Washington has imposed a cap 
on the total amount of marijuana that can be produced per year in the state. 80 metric tons, 40 for bud and 40 tons for other products, for infused and oils and whatever else, right? So 80 tons of weed will be legal in the state. Now, the idea behind this in Washington was to limit the annual production to avoid diversion, to avoid uh, growing a billion tons in Washington and then shipping most of it out of state. Colorado does not have a cap on how much marijuana can be produced, but regulators say they might do so in the future if necessary. Now, there's disagreement on to whether this is a good idea. Stephen D'Angelo thinks it's a good idea because he says if there's too much supply, then the competition amongst retailers becomes about cutting corners, trying to make sure that they can... Uh, is all, all about cutting corners and trying to make sure that they uh, uh, can still compete in the marketplace. All right, well, we're going to take a break, figure out what happened with our stream, and when we come back, we'll talk some more about this. designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belville Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. harmless. That's what everybody says these days. It's fun. It's recreational. Some even call it medicine. But every year, millions of young people find out that marijuana is extremely dangerous. Every year they find out that it's deadly. Marijuana smoke is lethal and toxic. Don't believe anything you've ever heard positive about smoking marijuana. It will kill you. Really. It's really going to kill you. It's, don't, don't, don't smoke it. It will really, really kill you. Seriously. It's going to kill you. It is only coincidence that the camera shot comes up on Ryan the Red and a song by the Ginger Ninjas is playing. It's only coincidence. I know, and you have your little Ginger Ninja blade there, man. Ginger Ninja blade. Ginger Ninja. <laughs> Not bad. We can play show and tell. Can you show them that... Uh, is that a Happy Daddy tool? Damn right, it's a Happy Daddy tool. 
on that cam. There you go. Does that work? It looks like a little sword. What other camera do I got? There you go. It's front cam. I got my oil slick container here. Oil slick and Happy Daddy represented right here at Roller J Studios. Yeah, say, say they go together like bread and booter. <laughs> bread and booter. <laughs> That's clever. So uh, the Happy Daddy tool. Tell people why they need this instead of a paper clip. Uh, or whatever the hell people grab to dab. It's high grade uh, steel or titanium. I believe this one's titanium. And they're, uh, they're designed very well. They don't get hot, uh, well, super hot, you know, um, when you're dabbing. And they're, they're all sorts of cool shapes and sizes. And I have a little tool set weapons. here. Yeah, he's got, you know. Show off. Let's see yeah. the difference. See, this is some of the original stuff here. So that's the uh, the grind and meant for cleaning out those grinders that the lighter mate lighter goes in. Oh yeah. And that's the pipe pal right there. Uh, of course, you use these all just for dabbing. So far. Uh, but uh, they were intended for other things originally. But and then you've got the little bombers. The, I think these are the booter bombers. And those are go good more for the liquid ish. The liquid stuff, you know, or the uh, you know the, the more powdery booter. There we go. So check them out, Oil Slick and Happy Daddy, good friends of the show and soon to be sponsors. We just gotta Slick. get in touch with them. I want this whole desk outlined in Oil Slick, slick pads. pads. Yeah, we need this entire God, thing awesome. slick padded out. That would be awesome. That would be slick. Uh, I've been meaning to get to it, but you know, I get busy doing other things. Yep. Have to get a hold of them. All right. So uh, coming back to this article that we were just talking about. Um, on the differences between Colorado and Washington legalization, uh, that cap was the last thing we talked about, you know, limiting how much marijuana can be grown in the state. In Washington, it's limited to 80 metric tons. And then in Colorado, they don't particularly have a limit. And the thought process on here is like in Washington state is limiting the production to avoid diversion to the uh, illegal market, supposedly here. And Stephen D'Angelo, who's with uh, you know Harborside, says this is a good thing because if you flood the market, then marijuana becomes cheap enough. You know, supply and demand's in effect, right? Marijuana becomes cheap enough that in order to compete in the legal market, especially one that's taxed when the illegal market's not, they'll have to cut corners on in other ways, right? Like maybe taking substandard medicine, maybe taking uh, you know using pesticides, whatever it might be, right? That's D'Angelo's theory. Uh, Aaron Smith from National Cannabis Industry Association says by limiting the legal market, they're enriching the illegal market. And that would be to say, you know, if 80 metric tons doesn't supply enough to Washingtonians, they will get it on the illicit market. But wouldn't they have to go through the first 80 tons first? But anyway, okay. Uh, the licensing is also different. In Colorado, for the first few months, first few months until summer it's vertically integrated and that's just a fancy term that means the business has to be involved at all levels right you have to be growing it and you have to be processing it and you have to be selling it all in-house right no separate grower selling to a separate trimmer who then sells to a, a store who then sells to a customer no your company has to run it from the moment it was a seed or a seedling to the moment it was grown and harvested and trimmed to the moment it was sold on the sh on the shelf. Now, part of doing this was uh, to appease the medical market that existed there, that still exists there, by making sure they kind of got the first dibs and they were the ones that were already set in this vertical integration. But Barbara Broll, who's one of the state regulators, said this would limit the number of businesses, making it easier to control the new market. Yeah, but on the other hand, couldn't you say that it kind of creates it puts these businesses in a much stronger position than they would be if they had to compete with a bunch of separate producers. There's that argument. But in the summertime, Colorado was going to open the market to specialized roles. So we'll see how that turns out. By contrast, in Washington, you can't do it that way. You can't be the grower, the processor, and the retailer. They only allow special roles. You can only be involved in one stage. If you've got a company, you can be a grower or a processor or a seller. And Washington's intent behind this, according to Aaron Smith, 
uh, or no, I'm sorry, it says uh, not Aaron Smith, the other Smith in the article who is the spokesman for the Washington Liquor Control Board, uh, was to avoid allowing monopolists to keep prices artificially high. Well, I don't know about that because prices in Colorado are pretty low. <laughs> so maybe the vertical integration worked at that extent. But would they be lower if there was more competition at more levels? Hmm. You get to find out. And this is one nice thing is that we will be able to find out between Colorado and Washington. We'll be able to see what works. And that's what's so nice about both of them passing. <laughs> you know, during the whole campaign leading up to the 2012 election, when we had three marijuana legalizations on the ballot, you know, I-502, Amendment 64, and Oregon's Measure 80, one of the arguments that I heard coming out of the I-5, the no on I-502 camp was, well, my God, we don't want to pass this legalization because it would set a precedent. Well, the only way, and then I said, well, the only way it could set a precedent if it's the only one that passes, <laughs> right? Because now we've got, and as this article's pointing out, we got a, two different blueprints on how to legalize marijuana that get to play out in real time, both in states that are more similar than they are un than they are different, right? This is this is everything you could ask for in public policy to be able to see two different theories, two different competing methods of how to pull this off. The precedent that will be set is which one of them and which aspects of both of them work, <laughs> and not just for our point of view, but also from the public's point of view. So that's what's going to be setting precedents, folks. Here's another difference that they brought up in this article was uh, Washington's regulations, uh, or I'm sorry, Colorado has a two-year minimum residency requirement for any owner or investor, while Washington only has a three-month requirement. Part of this was done, especially in Colorado, to allay fears of the federal government saying, oh, it's just going to be money laundering for illegal drug dealers, right? I'm an illegal drug dealer from the Mexican cartel. I'll just swoop into, into Colorado, set up my legal pot business, and launder my proceeds from illegal deals and send weed through, you know, the, the big bad carpet bagging Mexicans are going to come in or whatever. The drug dealers are coming, right? What this has really done, though, is it's kind of stymied the development of the market there in Colorado because there's a lot of people who know a whole lot about the marijuana business in California and have access to some funding there that could be doing some great work in Colorado, but they're not allowed to. So I don't know about these these residency requirements. I mean, do we have these kind of residency requirements for people that want to own liquor stores or, or own a bar? You know, if they want to start a bar, I'm asking because I don't know uh, about you know business regulations in that respect. But I can't think that there is. Are there? Maybe someone in the chat room can tell me. Regardless, people from around the world are watching both Washington and Colorado. And this is why I got a little inflamed and involved in that Proposition AA argument that's still going on in Colorado about the marijuana taxes. Um, because, again, I, to me, you can't say whether the, price, whether the tax is, is too high yet until we found out whether or not it actually pays for the promises that Amendment 64 made. You know, that it would make X number of dollars for schools and that it would, you know, fund itself as far as the regulations go. Right now, if if, you know, the taxes pass, and we have surpluses for a couple of years. Well, then now we've got an argument for passing something to reduce those taxes. But, man, I, the thing I just worry about is not having the money to regulate the 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 marijuana industry to the point where the feds come in and start raiding our opponents get to say, see, we tried legalization and it can't work. It can't work. See, no much. You all those pie in the sky promises about all the tax money. See, it was all just BS from the stoners. That's what I fear. So I'm not, I mean, like, I guess my first priority is let's, let's, let's make it work. Let's make the regulations work and let's see that our promises that we upheld our promises about how we were going to help fix schools and all of this. Let's not make it tougher for the next state. And maybe that's, maybe, you know, maybe that's my problem is I tend to think of this in national terms instead of local terms. Maybe this argument's a completely different argument if you're living in Colorado, but 
to me, when I'm talking to my friends in Texas and Florida and Georgia and Tennessee who want to get marijuana legalized, when's it ever going to get legal for us? Every time I have to think of these stories of, of uh, complaints about taxes that might lead to an ounce costing $185, Ooh. that it just seems maybe I take too broadest perspective. Maybe I'm just thinking, you know, why make this a tougher argument for legalization in Texas? Why make it impossible for Texas to say, if we pass legalization, we'll raise $40 million for schools? When Colorado said the same thing and it didn't turn out. That's, that's what I worry about. I worry about what we're doing as far as, you know, and again, this was the argument used against me, the precedence argument. Well, what precedent are we setting? If we promise tax revenue from legalization, and then the minute the tax vote comes up, we oppose the tax vote. What precedent does that set with people's trust in marijuana reformers, the next group that wants to try to pass legalization, or even medical in some states? You know, these, these legalization issues and us as legalizers, while we understand there's a lot of division and differences and nuance in our opinion, to the outside world, it's just the, the marijuana people. It's just the marijuana issue, right? Yeah. They see it in much broader, broader pictures. And the general picture that's been formed of us for many years is, you know, being the stoners, can't get their shit together, you know, the pie in the sky, the dreamers, the hippy dippy idealists. And we do ourselves no favors when we, you know, promulgate Live images and that ideas that, uh, that lead into that, uh, that stereotyping. But anyway, that's, uh, that's about all I want to say about that. When we come back, I want to talk about another article that's making the rounds. I've seen it in a couple of different outlets so far. Another example of not your father's Woodstock weed. You never should have said that, Russ. I know. So we pay for our mistakes in little ways. <laughs> we'll talk about the new super hyper potent ultra mega dank skunk when we come back. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Got a comment, question, complaint, or request for 420radio.org? Visit our contact page at 420radio.org slash contact today. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for baking pot brownies? The best destinations for a ganja getaway? How to hide herb in your car? Whether to grow your own? How precisely to legalize it? Or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place? Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook rolls all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history, profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. My heavens love, but the sun the same. Seems I'm always looking when I hear your name. You've been away, but don't leave this side. See all of your faces you've tried to hide So I'm sitting here in a train station Lord knows I 
50 after, actually 51 after here. That's Pepper with Trade Winds. And just wrapping things up here, there's a few, uh, a few things I want to get to. One of the comments in this legalized hemp article uh, points out what exactly I'm trying to say about the, the way that we get painted. This uh, one commenter says, Hemp can provide us with most of our needs. Clean burning biofuels due to rapid growth cycle requiring less land than corn. Hemp foods, arguably, arguably the most nutritious food source on the planet and presently one of the hottest health food trends in North America. Clothing fibers, healthy cooking oils, paper, building materials from a musical instrument to the body of a stealth bomber. It's even stronger than cement at one-sixth the weight. And you don't need fertilizers or chemicals to grow hemp. And there is absolutely no part of the hemp plant that cannot be easily utilized. Okay. I can agree with everything that was just said there to some degree. So the question is, why isn't China doing that? Why isn't Britain doing that? Why isn't France doing that? Why isn't Belgium doing that? Why isn't Australia doing that? Why isn't Russia doing that? Why isn't New Zealand doing that? Why is there 30 why are there 30 countries in this on this planet that have the economy and infrastructure necessary to be able to benefit from everything that was just listed there, not taking advantage of it. Because we ban it? I just don't get that part of it. And I'm not necessarily disagreeing with what the author of that comment said. There's all sorts of wonderful things you can make from hemp. So why isn't it happening? And then one comment I'm getting back from folks is lack of, uh, in you know, he said, one of the commenters earlier here said that, you know, for 80 years there hasn't been, uh, you know, they stopped with all development of hemp processing and, and technology 80 years ago while these other crops have had the, the benefit of the development of harvesting technology. Really? So nobody right now could manufacture a machine comparable to machines that are used for similar crops to harvest hemp because we stopped that research 80 years ago. See, that it's those kind of things, these kind of statements that just make me cringe because I'm with you. I'm on your side. I think hemp should be legal. And I think it does make some of these most wonderful things. But I can't sit here and defend things any longer that are just these wild pie-in-the-sky things that make us look silly. You know? Let's just get to the point that it's a crop. There's no point in banning a crop. We, the, the whole sales game of of how wonderful a crop it is you don't get that sales game you know for any other crop right i mean we can make we do make lots and lots of things for corn from corn in fact too many things that we depend on from Ooh. corn but you know nobody's making it a big deal because it's got this you know hemp the hemp argument's got this marijuana argument attached to it like a parasitic twin and it changes and distorts the argument from what it, you know, all these arguments about how great hemp is, in a sense, are implied reactions to, it's not marijuana. See what a great thing it is? See how great hemp it is? It's not pot. It's, it's such this great thing. Let's just say it's a crop. This, the fight to show how great a crop it is kind of seems like a reaction to saying it's not marijuana. And in framing, by doing that, we attach the marijuana issue to the hemp issue when it doesn't need to be attached. Hemp doesn't not to, need to be not pot anymore. Hmm. Hemp needs to be crop now. That's what I, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. The, the more we try to say it's not pot, see, that's one of the things in framing. It's yeah. like hemp is just hemp. 
Yeah. It's just it's just him. Lakoff's book was titled Don't Think of an Elephant. And the point was you yeah, can't negate not, a frame. You the can't minute, not think of an elephant. When you bring up a frame, yeah. whether you have a knot in front of it or not, you bring up a frame. So when we say, you know, hemp is not, it's dope not it's it's rope not dope, you immediately bring dope into the conversation. I, I like the one, don't picture yourself wearing a pink tutu. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Hey, before we go here, uh, and I've got a call coming in on my phone, but I can't answer it right now, but I will in five minutes. Uh, before I go, though, I wanted to mention one other thing, and that was the Not Your Father's Woodstock Weed uh, article that's out. <laughs> This article Never. that uh, came out, <laughs> this okay. is um, Getting High, the Potency well, of Today's Marijuana. Well, th this definitely isn't your father's Woodstock weed <laughs> because they didn't do dabs back then. And so it talks about, this is in Connecticut, uh, and I've seen it reprinted elsewhere, and it opens with the generation that smoked marijuana through the 60s and 70s and who now might be returning to it for medical reasons could be surprised at just how much the weed has changed over the decades. The pot, uh, the, the years of underground plant science have wildly increased its potency. The level of active ingredient tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, found in pot can range from 4%, the average for the popular Mexican weed of the 70s, to a whopping 35%. So the popular Mexican weed of the 70s, you know, Acapulco Gold, I guess, was the popular Mexican weed. Acapulco is Mexico, right? Yeah. Michoacan, yeah. heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was 4%, apparently. Well, uh, maybe if it was full of seed, it wasn't Sensi. <laughs> yeah, see, Sensi Amelia, look it up, fellas. Yeah, seed is, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Seeding process decreases potency in the flowers of the female cannabis plant. Fact... Uh, uh, science. Blah, this one says, blah. Uh, with the heightened THC levels, it has gone from an experience in which euphoria and brilliant storms of laughter, ecstatic reveries, and extensions of one's personality on several simultaneous planes are to be completely expected, as Alice B. Toklas described it, to one that now packs a much stronger punch. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> it's like I, I just smoked some uh, like it was either 27 or 28 percent THC OG you know that my buddy picked up just yesterday and uh, yeah I got a good, nice good head high but uh, no don't think I'm dying or anything we should tell people I mean to be fair there's good weed out there now there is and it's accessible and and maybe it will will be stronger than what you experienced back in the day when you smoked some, because maybe you had you bad weed connections. <laughs> so, so do go easy. Do what Tommy Chong does. Tommy Chong calls it the rat test. Mm. You know, it's like a rat eating a piece of food when it's going to try to make sure he doesn't die. He don't eat all the cheese. No. He eats a little nibble of the cheese, and then he waits. It's make like, sure you don't die. It's like lawyer John Lucy says, can you count to one? <laughs> it's a, try that number first for your dosage. One. <laughs> try, okay, try one. Yeah, one little. You know. <laughs> one. Try one. Exactly. And if, and that's, and if that's good, then move on. That's why I want to tell people, if, if you are getting back into marijuana after a long absence... Don't jump on this. Don't jump on the dabs. Smoke a puff of a joint and see where you're at. Don't try the brownies. Don't no. try the edibles. Please. Start with a joint. See where you're at. And those gummies are deceiving too. Don't, don't, you know. <laughs> well, folks, that's all the time we got here. But coming up next, we've got Coral Reefer with three different episodes. Ooh, four. Looks like one didn't get burned here. I'll have to do that burn here. Uh, but we have three new episodes of Stony Sunday coming up next here on 420 Radio. And then at 8 o'clock, a new episode of The Viper Hour with me, Radical Russ. So enjoy. <laughs>